Dr. Shay Shamurti is the younger generation, learned, very learned, dynamic, cataract, cornea, and refractive surgeon of our Eye Foundation group of hospitals. And he again is going to share with you all some wonderful, great pearls of wisdom. So on to you, Dr. Shayas. Yeah, I said I'd like to thank uh, AOS and ART for the opportunity. Can I have my video on, please? So this is a patient who had a 70-year-old lady who had a large uh, therapeutic graft for uh, fungal keratitis, non-responsive to medical treatment. And over a period of time, this therapeutic graft failed. So it's somewhat similar to what uh, Dr. Susan had shown, but it's a slightly different technique where instead of using some lateral illumination at the limbus, I'm using a chandelier illumination. And I also use a little bit of glycerol to detergesence, uh, to cause some detergesence of the stroma because it's a chronically failed graft. So there'll be a lot of stromal edema. And even though it's almost a grade three uh, cataract, the visibility without, uh, with the regular light is very, very poor. Now this is the advantage of using a complete uh, chandelier illumination where you switch off the uh, operating microscope, where even through a very hazy uh, cornea, as well as uh, through a dense cataract, and the epithelium can also be removed in aiding the visibility. You can see that the entire visibility with the uh, ritual illumination, the chandelier illumination is beautiful. You can actually go ahead, do a very nice rexus, go ahead and do a very uh, neat uh, direct chop. Uh, mind you, these are patients uh, it's a slightly older patient, so the cataract is also a little bit on the denser side and you need to chop the cataract and your visibility needs to be good. And with the uh, chandelier illumination, although it looks like a negative image, but you get excellent illumination, you will be able to even visualize the edges of the rexus, do your chopping very much, very well controlled inside the bag, and then do a absolutely safe phaco emulsification. It's extremely important in these cases because you are going to combine it with an endothelial keratoplasty. And therefore, having an intraocular lens in the bag is of extreme use. Because during your subsequent air bubble management, if your IUL is not stable, the bubble might go behind the lens. It might push the lens, uh, lens forward and make it a lot more difficult. Because this is a very hasty con uh, done a few years back, I was not doing a, willing to venture uh, doing a DMEC in this case, but I'm uh, proceeding with a DSEC, uh, where uh, using a 500 micron, I've dissected out a thin lenticule and I push it in with a sheet slide. Another caveat to use is probably either to have the incision scleral or have the incision clear corneal. It's important that we don't go through the graftose junction so that there is no graftose junction dehiscence. And then subsequently, you just go ahead with your air management, uh, fill in the uh, globe with air. Again, in all these failed grafts, especially these large grafts, it's difficult to achieve a very tight tamponade. So ensure you're suturing all the ports, the main port, the side port, uh, even remove the uh, sclerotomy site, uh, suture it completely, and then uh, also make uh, additional venting incisions uh, to ensure that whatever little interface fluid is there is also removed. So essentially just wanted to highlight the use of uh, retro elimination in doing cataracts in patients who have this kind of diffuse opacity rather than focal opacity. So in focal opacities, again, just the side illumination, uh, illumination along the limbus, is quite sufficient and you'll be able to get away with it. But in this kind of diffuse edema, uh, the illumination at the limbus doesn't give you enough visibility and putting in a chandelier illumination makes the entire procedure very, very simple and very straightforward. Uh, that was a wonderful video, Dr. Shares. I'm going to put both my questions together so that you can answer me. With this amount of compromise on your the visibility of the surgery, why couldn't you have done an open sky technique in the first place for this patient? And then you've already explained why you've uh, done a chandelier. You could uh, get it further clear why you would do chandelier in these cases. And if you're not using any of these techniques, what are the other ways a regular surgeon could do to get about doing these cases with opacity and uh, lack of visibility? Uh, doing a triple procedure as a PK ECCIOL is also possible. It's not, a, it's not an unreasonable option. And probably if it was an opaque graft with uh, corneal scarring, uh, then I would have gone on to do this. But this is only an edematous graft, a chronically edematous graft. There was no scarring in the cornea. The patient went on to have a BCBA of 6.9. So uh, in these cases, uh, it's always better to attempt an endothelial keratoplasty. It definitely gives uh, better results. Additionally, the factor of rejection, uh, definitely in a PK, 
uh, in a already previously failed graft, uh, the risk of uh, rejection is a lot more. A lot more. It's a very large graft already vascularized. So definitely PK, the risk of rejection will be a lot more. So doing an endothelial keratoplasty definitely helps. And the chandelier elimination, like I highlighted, definitely in these cases, uh, a very important thing is uh, what Dr. Susan showed. One probably thing which she didn't highlight is she also has excellent assistance uh, right through her surgery to beautifully hold the light, uh, led the light in the correct positions when she's doing the surgery. With a chandelier, it's actually like having a third hand. You can just uh, put it in the vitreous cavity and you're completely free. And uh, you can just go ahead and do your uh, cataract surgery as you would do in a normal FACO without ever having to worry about your assistant holding the light in the right position. So, uh, shall we go on to Shresh's second video? Any question, Dr. Roy? No, I think uh, we go on and complete and then we'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. So, your next video? Uh... Yeah, can I have my next video on? So, the next video is actually to highlight just a very simple point that is to take care of the ocular surface before we proceed with the cataract surgery. Uh, it is important that uh, this is a patient with Steven Johnson syndrome. And in Steven Johnson syndrome, especially patients who've had uh, Steven Johnson syndrome several years back, 20 or 30 years back, they may not really give you the history of having had an uh, SGS episode back. And often you would find that the cornea has a little bit of uh, punctate erosion, some vascularization, and without a careful examination, you might miss out the fact that this patient actually has very keratinized lid margin. And it is this keratinized lid margin which is going to make it extremely difficult for a patient who is uh, subsequently going to undergo a cataract surgery. If you did not replace this with a uh, uh, lid margin mucosa, then the subsequent cataract surgery can actually cause breakdown of the surface, rubbing of this keratinized lid margin on the surface, causing corneal melt and even perforation, making it extremely difficult. This is what had actually happened in the other eye of this same patient, uh, where she had undergone treatment elsewhere. And only later, after she had developed all those problems when she came here, a diagnosis of SJS was actually made. She was just pre diagnosed as a vascularized corneal opacity and a dry eye. But uh, since Steven Johnson syndrome was missed out, this was, this was the problem she had developed. And now with the lid mucous membrane graft, you can see the surface is stabilized. There is still a residual corneal opacity which will remain in place. But then you can go ahead and deal with the cataract in a second sitting. Once this uh, lid margin mucosa is completely healed, can you proceed with the video please? Yeah, once it is completely healed, uh, you can, after about four to six weeks, you can proceed with the cataract surgery. Uh, again, these are patients who will have extensive simplifera, shallow fornices. So it's difficult to insert a speculum inside. So use these traction sutures then go ahead with the cataract surgery as you would do in a patient with an opacity. This is again a patient where probably a lateral illumination helps better where you can use a lead pipe because this uh, intermittent cataract and the chandelier illumination will not give you any light or a, a red reflex. Uh, but there was sufficient uh, clear area apart from the area of opacity for me to go ahead with the cataract surgery itself. Just as you can see in the area of opacity where I'm trying to complete my rectus, I'm having a little bit of difficulty visualizing that uh, particular area. So I go ahead and complete the rexus uh, with a forceps, and then I do my uh, a minimal gentle hydro rotate the mucus. Now in these cases, it's uh, you can use your preferred check, uh, technique of cataract, but I prefer doing a direct chop. The main reason is it's difficult to uh, look at the depth of your trench in these cases because of a slightly hazy cornea. Whereas you can occlude in this cataract, you'll have generous, uh, a fairly dense cataract, generous occlusion, and then go ahead with your direct chop. Ensure you have sufficient lateral separation, you've broken it down into sufficient number of pieces, and then uh, slowly bring it out one piece uh, by one and emulsify it. And uh, preferably while you're emulsifying it, try to tilt the flow, probe a little uh, superiorly away from the area of opacity. So you're actually seeing the nucleus rotating at the tip, you, are a, you know that the tip is still occluded and that you're not boring through the nucleus and having a PCR in these kind of hazy corneas would be disastrous. So ensure you're constantly visualizing the tip while you go ahead with the surgery. And then you can go ahead and place the lens and uh, put it in the uh, uh, bag and then go ahead and suture these uh, ports. A anytime in a compromised cornea, it's always better to put in a suture as sometimes uh, e even though your incision might be good, they are not self-sealing. Uh, because the peripheral cornea might be a little thinner, place an air bubble, and then that's the end of the surgery. So the patient did uh, re reasonably well. 
uh, of course, uh, continued to require uh, scleral contact lenses, as is often the case with SGS, but went on to have a vision of about 612 with the scleral contact lens. Thank you so much. Sir. That was a wonderful surgery, Dr. Shreyas. Uh, one simple question, and I would also want Susan to um, add up to it. Uh, so basically, you dealt with the keratinized epithelium and taken care of the ocular surface with a beautiful MMG yes, uh, graft. Where do you get these grafts from? In the lip mucosa? Yeah, Buckle from mucosa? the lip mucosa uh, works better. Buccal mucosa is a uh, little thicker. So I'd prefer to use uh, a lip mucosa and uh, that, that gives you a nice thin graft. At the same time, it's well rounded, helps you form the lid margin very nicely. Could you highlight on some other ocular surface issues which come up? Uh, we as cat routine cataract surgeons would miss out on it. How these need to be dealt with prior to the surgery so that the outcome of your cataract surgery is optimal? Yeah, I mean, this is an extreme case uh, with, uh, I mean, Stephen Johnson syndrome, where, but uh, a, a very even run-of-the-mill cases where you might have patients with just uh, MGD uh, or patients with the rheumatoid arthritis who might be on treatment, might not be really telling you that they are on treatment. It's very, very important that we look at the cornea, look for subtle signs of punctate erosion, uh, any alteration in the tear film, look at the mabobian gland, because stabilizing the ocular surface, stabilizing the uh, surface inflammation is extremely important. Treating the cause is extremely important before going ahead with the cataract surgery because uh, it can have disastrous results. Even a very uh, subtle finding which can be missed can actually, the, uh, during the cataract surgery, they may have, uh, or the basic insult of the surgery itself will cause some focal epithelial breakdown. And these patients have difficulty in epithelialization subsequently and gives rise to this vicious cycle where it'll, the epithelialization will not occur and therefore the stroma becomes inflamed and there is a melt and subsequent perforation. So it's extremely important that we identify these cases early and treat them at the early. Dr. Susan? Yeah, I think uh, that was a very beautifully managed uh, case, Shreyas, both of them. Uh, one thing that I would like to add is uh, when you come across these kind of patients, you know, uh, one thing to rule out is always of course, a psychiatric pemphigoid because those are the cases where you don't want to go in and, you know, uh, do surgery on the conjunctiva or start start off, uh, actually trigger off a pr process of inflammation. So that's uh, one thing that you want to uh, rule out. Uh, uh, the buccal mucous membrane graft was done beautifully. I think one th extra thing that I would, I generally do is to put uh, fibrin glue so that, you know, you get a nice uh, contact of the buccal mucous membrane graft on both sides of the lid, on the lid margin as well as on the inner aspect. And there's no edema or fluid accumulation under it. And you get a very nice flat, uh, uh, you know, uh, apposition in the post-operative period. I think uh, no, uh, other than that, I... many times Please. you uh, often also need to put these patients on autologous serum. And of course, that post-operative management becomes extremely important. You sometimes have to put an AMG and all these things. Um, so the, that's about that. Uh, about the other case, the uh, penetrating, the, the question that uh, Sitra Mam and asked about penetrating keratoplasty, I'd really like to uh, stress uh, on this uh, uh, to, you know, the message to reach as wide as possible that uh, endothelial keratoplasty, especially in the form of DMEC and PDEC, is the way to go. Uh, you know, the really uh, penetrating keratoplasty doesn't have a role uh, if you have just edematous cornea without a scar. And many times, even the scarring, if it's very subtle scarring, you still get very good vision uh, with just the endothelial keratoplasty, a lot of the scar goes away with time and you get uh, very, very excellent results. Uh, so uh, there's really no need to disturb a graft and redo a full penetrating keratoplasty and get all the problems of a neurotrophic cornea, suture related issues and all these things. Start off that entire cascade of cycles all over again when you have this beautiful, uh, very quick rehabilitation that's possible for these patients. Uh, the only uh, uh, places where I would possibly do a penetrating keratoplasty is one of course a thick stromal scar which uh, is not going to resolve with time and the second one is uh, if your first uh, penetrating keratoplasty suturing is so bad and you've got so much of irregular astigmatism that it's too difficult to tackle uh, then maybe i might consider that but generally on the whole you you prefer to do this with the pupiloplasty you can get a improved vision so you know there's so many things please don't uh, do a penetrating keratoplasty unless absolutely indicated yeah i agree okay, with you. Yeah. when i asked this question i felt i knew what the answer was but I thought it, I needed to generate discussion here. Do you have anything to add, Shresh, before I go on to the next? Shresh, no, how will, just you, that, uh, will, will you change your position of your cataract main incision uh, depending upon the opacity? 
the i mean uh, depending on the opacity definitely it can be changed uh, in this particular case it was just slightly uh, inferior so uh, doing a superior incision would have made it a little more difficult because the uh, opacity would have come in the way of all the chops and i would not have been able to visualize it so making a slight uh, temporal super temporal incision uh, at least for the majority of my peco i was able to avoid the opacity which is inferior uh very important to just cover that uh, as uh, uh, susan madam was also highlighting that to differentiate between sjs and ocp uh, especially the in the cataractogenic age group uh, of course this patient had a typical history uh, uh, drug reaction exanthematous uh, i mean a drug reaction and everything was there but uh, it's the lids which are most uh, useful in differentiating between an sjs and ocp and this uh, typical keratinized uh, surface is on uh, this thing is very typical of sjs and we have to really look for it it's very very easy to miss this uh, keratinized uh, lid margin it's not necessary that they have to have these thick white keratin plaques but even just the migration of the uh, dermal epithelium over the uh, tarsal surface of the conjunctiva which causes repeated rubbing and uh, that lid wiper syndrome and which causes subsequent breakdown of epithelium so unless we really look for it we might miss the subtle signs thank you shreyas 